right, welcome to the Father's House of Orange County. My name is Bianca Waters Oltoff, and as one of the pastors here, we're excited about today's message. But a little forewarning, if there's gentle ears in the room, the nature of the conversation is biblical, but also meant for adults. We hope you enjoy. Well, go ahead, grab a seat. Welcome to the Father's House. For those that are in the room, in the video experience, or watching online, we are excited that you're here. We are currently in a series entitled Boundary Lines, and... Once upon a time in a land far, far away, there was a man named Adam and a woman named Isha, uh, but everyone knew her as Eve. They lived in an absolute perfection, what the Bible calls shalom, and fruit grew on trees and vegetation grazed from the ground, and their neighbors were animals, and it was amazing. Scripture says that they basically, their jobs were to eat the fruit of the land, have sex, and live their life. I'm, I don't know about you, but that's the kind of job that I would want, all right? This is a good job description. And as fairy tale esque as this may sound, this is actually the Genesis account of humanity. God created man and woman and told them to enjoy the land and enjoy each other. Sex was God's invention, and he said that it was good. We serve an amazing God. That's all I want to say, all right? Oh, some of you guys came with your very frozen church faces because you're like, did she say sex? We're going to say that word a lot today, so be forewarned. If you brought tender ears into the room, we have an amazing kids experience. We'd love for you to put them there because we're going to have a little grown folk conversation today. So if this is how God had intended it for Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden in this moment of shalom, where did the story go wrong? Well, God's plan for love and life and liberty and freedom for Adam and Eve went horribly wrong when boundary lines were crossed. That's why we are in an eight-week series unpacking boundaries that we need in all areas of our life and relationships. Why? Well, Pastor Matt and I want our congregation, our church, the sheep that God has entrusted us, we want you to live in redeeming what the enemy has stolen from you. We want you to live in a redeemed life, taking back what culture is trying to take from you. And the good news is, is that it's not too late to build boundaries for your benefit, all right? Let me tell you something, that sexual boundaries are for your benefit and it's not a burden. I'm going to say it twice because it was nice. Sexual boundaries are a benefit, not a burden. For the note takers in this space today, the title of today's message is Boundary Lines in Sex. So why don't we talk about sexual boundaries in church? Well, when we do talk, talk about sexual boundaries, it's from the lens and perspective of we don't talk about it, shh, no, no. And, and, and we pretend like no one's having sex, shh, no, that's weird, no, no, no. Or the other side of the spectrum is that when we do talk about sex, it's like, don't have sex, sex is horrible, you have sex and you're going to hell unless you're married. Then it's totally awesome and totally redeemed. And I think that both narratives have been really damaging to the church. Without a show of hands, without a show of hands, how many in this room have regret around sexual activity with someone that they're no longer with. Without a show of hands, how many would say that sex in the moment would feel a void, but then the empty bed and the cold sheets left you with a greater void than you had previously experienced? Without a show of hands, because I don't want anyone telling on themselves today, I don't want to look at you cross-eyed later. Without a show of hands, how many in this room have shame or embarrassment around even saying the word sex, because in your household, sex was something that was dirty. We don't talk about that, no. No, don't talk about that, no. And then when education happened, you had to get educated from random people from school, or cousins, or your neighbor. Without a show of hands, how many have experienced sexual abuse, sexual trauma, or secu sexual manipulation? Without a show of hands, how many would admit that because of their porn problem, past or present, that it's affected their view of their partner and their sexual satisfaction in their marriage. How many would bravely admit that sex with that random guy or that random girl was so mind-blowing, and yet in a marriage covenant, sexual satisfaction has waned? 
the core issue of every single one of these scenarios and every single one of your story is shame. Shame permeates our culture. The world is heaping shame on us. Shame is in the hands of our enemy and it's whispering shame, 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 shame. I mean, think about it. If you are in a Christian community, in a Christian context and you're having sex outside of marriage, it's like shame on you, shame on you for having sex outside of marriage. Well, then you go out into culture and culture's like shame on you for not having sex. You're weird, that's weird. Whatever you're doing, that's weird, shame on you. What about shame? from someone who has used you or abused you? What about shame that you are unsatisfied in your marriage covenant and disappointed with where you are sexually in your marriage? What about shame because you're not having sex six times a week, twice a day? Shame, 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 shame. Well, the world is heaping shame on you. I have come with a different message, shame off of you because of what Jesus has done. Today, that's the conversation we are gonna have. It, it, we have been dealing with the same feelings of guilt and shame since the beginning of time, since the Garden of Eden, and since the beginning of this series. Pull out your Bible and turn with me to Genesis chapter 2. If you're sitting here thinking, we're in Genesis 2 again, for the 746th time, we're going to read this passage again. Yes, it's that good. It's that good. In Genesis 2.25, we see that they're in the Garden of Eden. This is shalom. This is perfection. And we read in verse 25, Adam and his wife were both, what? Amen. Oh, you said that like some real conservative church people. <laughs> There's no feeling, no emotion. They, they were, I believe the scientific term is naked. Now, nah, uh, I want you to read this like God intended. Adam and his wife were both, what church? Amen. Yes, and they felt no Shame. Some of you felt shame saying the word naked. As we've read, Adam and Eve partook of forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden and immediately their eyes were opened. Their eyes were opened to the sin and the boundary line that they crossed. The first thing that they did, you fill in the blank, the first thing that they did, make your pastor proud like you've been paying attention in this series. The first thing that they did after partaking in the fruit was what, church? They hid extra credit for you. See, all the good Christians sit right in the front row, right here. Yes, they hid. What is that? It's shame. They hid. And they covered themselves. Now, prior to this moment, the Bible says that they were naked and unashamed. Well, what can we get from this text? What was the intent? The intent was that that was good. It's the perfect design. There is no shame in their naked game. Hallelujah. All right? The moment sin entered the world, baby, that's when everything changed. And the same is true today. Same is true today. Within the marriage covenant, Sex, intimacy, connection, listen to me, lust. That's a gift from God. Hallelujah, what a good God we serve. Sex outside of the marriage covenant will be used as weapons in your enemy's hands because it will be used against you and it will heap shame on you. Do I know why churches and pastors don't talk about sex in church? Yes, not only does it feel like a junior high sex ed talk to a bunch of people, it's also very nuanced and layered. And I know that it could be a booby trap emotionally for some people. So what we wanna do is we wanna step back. We wanna speak in general terms, but with specific application. When we talk about sex in a room of this size, and even to the thousands online who will watch this message, Statistically speaking, it is safe to say that almost every single person, if not all, has some sort of sexual experience that has changed you in some way. Everyone, statistically speaking, has some sexual experience that has changed you and your core in some way. And we can sit in a room of this size and shame will be triggered. Maybe you discovered porn at a very young age and you've been addicted since then. Shame. Maybe you were given porn by a family member or a dad and it's heaped shame because it's now affecting how you view 
intimacy and your spouse. Maybe you've had an uninvited or unsolicited touch or sexual abuse as a child or as an adult, and it's affected the way that you engage in sex. Maybe you have an illicit past. Before following Jesus, you hooked up with him and her and them, and you, you, you had a wilding out life, and then you met Jesus, and you're living a life of purity. But now as a follower of Jesus, you're left with the images in your mind that haunt you like sexual ghosts. Maybe you're here in this room and and you waited to have sex until you were married and you did it right. And whether through a traumatizing first experience or an underwhelming first sexual experience, you feel let down by God. Maybe you were raised in purity culture within church and it somehow messed up your view of sex and intimacy. Do you know that those aren't fictitious stories? That could be your story. That's the story of people who are sitting here today. And we all carry that with us. Every single one of us has experienced some sort of shame revolving around sex. And the reason why we have to talk about this is because these experiences will shape who we date, how we date them, and how our life will be after we marry them, if we marry them. So let's make sure that we're opening up this conversation to everyone in the room, because this conversation isn't just for single people who have to be pure. If you're married in here today, and you're like, I'm glad they're talking about this for the single people. No, 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 all of us need to be pure, okay? Jesus says, or God Almighty says in the Old Testament, be holy, for I am holy. What's living a life of purity? I'm not going to be like the world. I'm going to abide by what the good God, what our good God says in his holy writ, in his holy word. And I'm passionate, if you haven't noticed, I am passionate about taking back the messaging and the narrative of sex because it is something that God created. And he said that it was good. And he said that it felt good. And he said that it was divine. Okay. And I want us to be honest and free and open about the conversations around shame to shine a light where the enemy has tried to keep your pain, your sin, your shame in darkness and silence. But where is this coming from? Well, we mentioned, yes, it's coming from our past, but then there's an additional layer of pressure by culture. Magazines, movies, and medias it is telling us what sex is, what it should look like, and how much we should be having it. No, 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 no. See, the one who creates sex is the one that gets to define it, okay? If we didn't invent it, we don't define it. So God, the creator of intimacy, the creator of sex, he has a boundary for sex. What is God's boundary for marriage? Oops, sorry, flip it and reverse it. What is God's boundary for sex? I gave you the answer. Thank you, Dean. Marriage, yes, yes. You guys are really frozen in church today. Everyone's afraid to talk back. Oh, it's going to get so much more fun. Trust me. Okay, so because we are redefining, actually not redefining, the Bible has defined, we are redefining what culture says about sex. I need us to have a very honest conversation. Behind me, I I want us to hold the dualities of a biblical worldview and a non-biblical worldview of what is sex. Family, on the screen, this is not Bianca's view of sex. This is the Bible's view of sex. What does the Bible say about sex? Sex was God's idea. That stands in stark contradiction for our postmodern Sexual, sexualized culture that says sex is an impulse. It's an urge. It's a feeling in your pants. What does the Bible say about sex? Sex is designed for the confines of covenant. We'll discuss covenant in a second. But, but according to the world, sex is with whomever, whenever, however, get it. Biblical worldview, a biblical view of sex is sex joins two people in emotional, physical, and spiritual union. What does the world say? Sex is for pleasure or to satiate an urge. What does the Bible say about sex? Sex is to be enjoyed after covenant. What does the world say about sex? (laughs) Sex after marriage is whack and boring. It's vanilla. It's missionary sex. I feel it's high time that we redeem that word because bless them missionaries on the mission field. They're probably not even having missionary sex, okay? We're redeeming it today. I don't want, oh, now you're with me. Now you're with me. All right, church. I don't want social media. I don't want pop culture. 
I don't want the ivory tower of academia to define what sex is. No, if you're the note-taking type, I want you to write this down. Sex was God's idea. What a good God. I'm glad I'm a Christian. Sex was God's idea. So what's the boundary? Because God designed it, he defines it. I made it ring so you can memorize it, yes. Because God defines it, because God designed it, God defines it. There in the Garden of Eden, naked Adam looks at naked Eve in Genesis chapter 1. And pause, because when my husband read this verse, he read it like in his very German way. He said, Adam looked at his wife and said, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. But, but that's what you heard. But what I heard was the very German way that I hear my husband when he is being very serious and academic. He says in a very German way, uh, this is bone of my bones, this is flesh of my flesh. I shall call you woman. This is very simple. This is like math. You are a woman. I'll feed us in. Pru, pru, pru. Like that's why I heard it, right? And I read this and I'm like, are you kidding me, Matthew? This is rhythmic poetry. Adam saw the first naked woman and she had boobies and he said, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, I shall call you woman. (laughs) How do you read your Bible? (laughs) You didn't read it like that? I'm sorry, you're basic. (laughs) Eat other ice cream besides vanilla, get on my level and hear it this way because scripture says they were naked and unashamed. That's a good word right there. Flip one page behind and go to Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Genesis 1, 28, the Holy Writ says, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Now, I know God is good at mathematics, but he's not speaking about arithmetic, addition, multiplication, or subtraction. No, 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 this isn't a farming term. In the BIV, the Bianca International Version, it, it, it says, Adam, baby, it's your honeymoon. All right, go handle business, bro. Enjoy, all right? This is God's intent for sex, and yet we treat it as in something that has to be whispered about and like, oh, can we say that we enjoy it? Absolutely. These are the first instructions that God gave to humanity. The first instructions were, go pray, go fast and, 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 and commune with me. No, he said, go have sex. And I want to pause for a second because sex is not just about procreation. And many churches speak about the reason we have sex is to multiply, it's strengthen the Lord's army. Now, sex is for procreation and some recreation in the nation. Hello. Somebody testify in here. Yes. Thank you, holy person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is not in my nose, but this is a little freezy and funsy. Do you know the people that are having the best sex? You know people having the best sex? According to non-religious science coming out of the University of Chicago, the people having the best sex are people that are engaged in monogamous, religious relationships and covenant. What is that? Christian people are getting the best sex, all right? Aren't you glad that you're saved? You're welcome. Yes, 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 absolutely. Intimacy, intimacy in the right context is amazing. Intimacy out of context is dangerous. So let's talk about it. Intimacy. From a biblical perspective, sex isn't God looking down in heaven and say, okay, yes, now you're married. No, it's not at the wedding vows. It's not at the hors d'oeuvres or the toast or the kissing of the bride or the announcement as man and wife. Do you know, biblically, pick it up with God, biblically, when God considers covenant to happen, it's not at I do. It's when a couple consummates a marriage. When a couple consummates marriage from a biblical worldview, this is what seals the covenant. So how many people are we saying I do to when we really don't? How many people are we committing a life or a sign of fidelity and commitment when it's really just a one night stand, it's a hit it and quit it, and we pass out this like Pez in a candy dispenser. We pass out Sex like it's a pastime. And I've seen good relationships, beautiful relationships that have a lot of potential go incredibly south because they allowed intimacy to come in. And the relationship came, became what can you do for me? What can you give me? They stopped focusing on who the person was and focusing on is this somebody that I could live potentially with the rest of my life? The reason why sexual boundaries are important is because there is power in sexual union. 
There's power in sexual union. The enemy knows that, that sex has a powerful grasp on our heart, on our mind, and our soul. And, and, and sex can be something that can absolutely distract you from the call of God, pull you out of your destiny, cause you to stumble through the act of temptation. And, and here's the thing. We have to get a handle on our sexual temptations because we think, well, then I'll just get married rather than burn and this will all go away. Nah, bro, that's a lie. Because what sex does post-marriage is that it reveals the toxins that are already in you. Your sexual past, your sexual distortions, your sexual addictions, guess what? They're still there. Now they come to the surface. And the lie of the enemy before, you have, before you're married is have sex, have sex, have sex, have sex. And then you get married and then the enemy is saying, don't have sex, it's so boring. Don't have sex, you don't like them. Don't have sex, it's basic. No. I'm going to be really honest in here, and I'm not saying this as a woman of God. I'm saying this as someone who's looking at the scope of Scripture, and, and I'm going to make this assertion boldly and say that if you are married and you're not intentionally engaging in the act of intimacy, um, you're giving the enemy room to come in and pull a divide between you and your spouse. Now, you get to determine what is regular intimacy and regular uh, moments of engaging in sexual activity. Because what happens is sometimes culture says that you're not having, if you're not having sex six times a week, twice a day, then, oh, shame on you, shame on you. No, no, no. There's seasons. There's seasons. Sometimes vacation, hey, this isn't like no bars held. Everyone's excited. There's no responsibility. Sometimes you have young kids and you're exhausted and the most intimate thing you could do is like chest bump, love you, good night. And that's romantic, you know? Like there's different seasons. So, so we're going to talk about this in a second between marriages. How do we have good, healthy communication so that we're both feeling loved? And seen and heard. Now, I get it. I don't want to put more shame on you. If there's a military deployment, or if there's physical illness, or maybe there's a season where you're like taking a break from intimacy, I get that. But by and large, as a general message, we don't want to give the enemy room in our marriages. Second thing that we see is sex links you and unites you to a person. So what's, if sex links you and unites you to a person, what's the boundary that we need to hold on to? Don't bond without a wedding band. I rhymed it so you would memorize it, all right? When two people come together in the sacred act of intimacy, they are joined together literally, anatomically. Two people are coming together. 1 Corinthians 6.16 says the two will become one flesh. The two become one flesh. And sex is a tri-dimensional experience. It's spirit. It's soul. It's body. And the problem that I'm seeing right now is when we have conversations around sex with Christians, a lot of unmarried Christians will say, well, what's the boundary line about how far I can go? And what's happening is we want to know how far we can go. Where's the line and how can I dance vigorously on it? You know, like how can I push the envelope? And what happens is because we're not having honest conversations in a very normal way that doesn't feel weird or that there's shame heaped. We're talking about sex and desires and passion being a good thing. That lust within marriage, I pray that you just are lustful over your spouse. I pray that. But what happens is within the Christian context is we've made sex the thing that we can't touch. And we've removed all the other things that bring in immorality. What the Bible refers to as sexual immorality. And so, yes, we can talk about sex as genitalia to genitalia. But let's not forget mouth to genitalia hand to genitalia because what we're doing is we're creating 50 shades of our own christian gray oh yeah i'm not having sex i'm not having sex but you're engaging in everything before that i mean let's not kid ourselves if you are here and you feel a little called out it's not condemnation maybe it's a little bit of conviction but i'm not bringing shame i want us to bring light to areas where the enemy wants us to keep dark if you're here today and you're like, I don't know what genitalia is, ask Pastor Matt. He will, he'll have that conversation with you, okay? Yeah. Anytime that you have sex with a person, you bond with them. And there is an emotional and a spiritual uh, connection that occurs during the act of sex because this is divine union. Now, sex within the confines of marriage is beautiful. Sex outside the confines of marriage is dangerous. In our house, we have a fireplace. We actually have a fireplace in our backyard, and sometimes Matt and I will light that fireplace, and it's so beautiful. It provides heat and comfort and warmth, and something just happens around a fireplace where really good conversations happen, and this is what we use to light that fireplace, and it's something good and amazing and beautiful. But this same instrument that provides warmth, great conversation, comfort, 
if put at your doorstep, can burn down your house. So in context, warmth, comfort, amazing provision. We can cook off of it. There's good things that happen with fire. Fire on your front doorstep, danger. It's the same thing with sex. So let me explain it this way. When someone is joined with another person sexually, there is a threefold cord that is formed. You are joined emotionally through the act of intimacy, physically through the act of sex, and spiritually through the act of covenant. Threefold cord coming together. Society will say, lose your virginity. Everyone's, everyone loses their virginity in high school. Culture will say, oh yeah, you can have a casual one night stand. Don't mind a booty call. It ain't a thing. But what's happening is that we are joining together emotionally, spiritually, and physically. When you have sex with that person, you are co-mingling, not just with their body. You're co-mingling with their soul. You're co-mingling with their mind. Dr. Uh, Dr. Daniel Amen, in his book, Change Your Brain, Change Your Life, he says that whenever a person sexually is involved with another person, there is a neurochemical bond that happens in our brain, and there is bonding in our limbic system. It's an emotional bond that happens in the act of sex that's actually in our brain. And limbic bonding is the reason why casual sex doesn't work. That's science. That's not even scripture. Here's this non-Christian person saying that when you have sex, it doesn't work because you're bonding without this attachment. And when two people decide to have sex, oh, for the fun of it, guess what? You are connecting with them on an entirely different level. Sex is enhancing an emotional bond with another person, whether you want to or not. So you can think it's a one-night stand. You can think it's a hit it and quit it. It's not. You're coming together with their soul, their body, and their spirit And this is not about uh, gender right now, but statistically speaking from science, because women have a larger limbic system, the person that is most likely hurt in emotional bonding and breaking up is women. And if Paul is correct, he's stating that two shall become one, the tripartite being, our, our body, our soul, and our spirit, we unite with that person. And in the context of marriage, it is beautiful and it is bonding. Outside the context of marriage, it is devastating, costly, against the will of God, and it is dangerous. Dr. Patricia Love says this in her book, The Truth About Love, that the feeling of intimacy that is desired actually happens in the act of sex through a chemical cocktail that is produced in the brain during sex. And that you can desire a person sexually after the act of sex for up to 24 hours. What is this? It is a physiological bonding. So long after the sexual escapades, you might find yourself mysteriously longing for the person that you may or may not even like. What is that? It's a bonding. For married people in the room, I'm going to ask something big of you. I'm going to ask you to have sex. I'm going to ask you to have lots of sex. I'm going to have, ask you to have lots of good sex. Let's not waste our time, you know. Have lots of good sex. If you need some help, I'm going to give some resources later, and we're going to do another marriage workshop because I'm passionate about people finding freedom within sexual boundaries in the context of marriage. But from sheer data alone, what happens uh, when you come together in the act of sex with your spouse? You're bonded to them. There is something that happens when you come together anatomically, physiologically, and emotionally. There's chemical cocktails that are going on in the brain. And so what I'm saying for the married people, it's about time we have happy hour, okay? We need some brain cocktails. You guys, that was funny. That was really funny. You guys are very serious, okay? We need a code for some marriage people in here. I'm going to call the workshop happy hour, okay? Like, we need a little something up in here. I also want to be very sensitive. Because I know that there's marriages in this room that are struggling with intimacy. And I think, I'm going to be very honest with you, I think that there are two conversations that married people should have monthly. No one's writing this down, and I'm giving you free therapy, okay? There's two conversations that married people should have monthly. A conversation about finance and a conversation about sex. Um, How do we have a conversation where you look at our spouse eye to eye and say, hey, this is not a danger zone. We're not going to fight. I want to connect with your heart. I want to connect with your mind. And eventually, baby, I want to connect with your body. Okay, some questions that we begin to ask is, hey, what are our financial goals? 
Our, for Matt and I, we live debt-free. It's a big value for us. Well, eventually, I would like to buy a house. So what are we doing and how are we saving? Did we go out to too many movies or go out to eat? Where do we need to save? Because we have financial goals. But I also want couples in this fellowship, couples in our community, couples in this house, to also have conversations about their sexual desires. What are our sexual goals? What, what, what fantasies do you have? How are we going to build this dream of a satisfied and satiated sexual life? I'm serious. We need to get comfortable with asking uncomfortable conversations. So some marriage boundaries for a be the bedroom must include this. Having open conversations about sexual expectations and frequency. How many times do you need to have sex in your relationship to feel satisfied and satiated? But then the second thing is respect. It's respecting each other's sex drives and compromising because maybe one partner has a very high sex drive and another partner has a very low sex drive, where do we find a healthy balance where we respect each other's desires? Also, communication. Openly communicating your desires and your wants in the bedroom instead of expecting your partner to understand what feels good to your body. Because we're grown, we're grown folk. We can have grown folk conversation to talk about these situations and after good communication, Engaging in non-sexual intimacy. I love this. No one's taking notes on this, and I'm going to say, yo bad, all right? Engaging in non-sexual intimacy, that is flirting with your spouse. That is little love notes, a post-it note on the coffee machine just to say that you love them. You know what my husband did? I'm going to brag on him. He's in Germany, and I miss him, and that's probably why this is coming out right now, and I need a filter, but whatever. The man knows I love flowers, and he bought a subscription that delivers flowers to my house every month. You know what that is? That is sexy. You know what that is? Non-sexual intimacy. Hello. Okay? Date nights. Date nights are wildly important. Do it. You don't need to be rich to go on date night. Free 99, baby. Go to the park. Plan a picnic. You got this. You got this. And lastly, this is my favorite. Unclothed cuddling without the expectation of sex. Thank you. Thank you, sis. You're on my team. I am giving you free therapy. Let me tell you that there is power in that. All right, there is power in that. And, and listen, the expectation doesn't that lead to sex, but sometimes it does. All right, you're welcome. You need to go, you need to spend unclothed cuddling time without the expectation of sex because that, my friends, is building intimacy, intimacy. Now, I, I, lastly, lastly, I want, I want couples to be creative and explore. I'm tired of hearing the narrative that married sex is boring. Then stop being boring, okay? Uh, let, let nothing defile the marriage bed, as Hebrew says. But if both of you guys are down, I mean, do it. Like, like be, be creative. Explore. Find out what feels good to you. Get free in the bedroom. Be a freak in the bedroom. <laughs> On the kitchen counter. In the, the, the car. I don't know. Whatever floats your boat. But stop being boring and basic. Get out of a rut. Now, what are some boundaries for singles? Single, please, please, singles, take notes, because married people, they, they, they're not taking notes. Single people, <laughs> write this word down, decision. You're going to make an individual decision. This is what I am choosing to for my life. This is my boundary line. This is my sex line. In the moment that you begin to date somebody, then you have a conversation, conversation to communicate who you're engaging with, what the boundaries are, what the boundaries are. Yeah, what are, what are the boundaries in our relationship that feels good? And, and, and sometimes we don't have this conversation because we're missionary dating and you're trying to flirt to convert. You, you know that somebody's not saved and you're trying to just love on them and drag them to church and do all the right things. No, no missionary dating, no missionary sex. That's a rule here, okay? There you go, all right? <laughs> Number three, as a single, respect, respect. Maybe my boundary is that I'm not going to have sex, but we could hold hands, we could kiss, I could French kiss you. Actually, it's a Hebrew kiss, all right, because in Song of Songs it says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. That's a French kiss, Hebrew kiss. You're welcome. Listen, listen, maybe my boundary is that, I, you know, I'm not going to have sex, but I could kiss you. But maybe Matt's boundary is I can't kiss you passionately because it's going to turn me on too much and I can't say no. What are the boundaries and how do we respect those boundaries? Number four, accountability. Bring people in. If you are engaged in a relationship, you know, sin breeds in darkness and in secrecy. Have someone that you trust that's not going to judge you, but just say, it's going to check in on a weekly basis or after date night. Hey, do you guys lay horizontal? All right? Or what, what, what are we doing? Are we keeping good lines here? You guys, I'm giving you all my best jokes. No one is playing today. 
Lastly, confession. Because you can have accountability, but if you're not willing to confess where you might have made some mistakes, it's just going to keep breeding the the facade within in Christianity where you can't have honest conversations because you might falter and you might fail. But this is a house where we're going to hold a high standard for holiness, but we're going to leave judgment to the Spirit of God. Lastly, sex will not give you intimacy. So what's the boundary for that? Don't give sex away for intimacy. The thing that you should know about sex is that you will never be able to exchange sex for intimacy. Intimacy and chemistry is formed with clothes on and eye contact. Having sex is no guarantee for a deep emotional intimacy that you're hoping for and that you're desiring for and and, and how you are wired for. Do you think Christ formed that desire in you? Alice Freiling says this in her article entitled, Why Wait for Sex? It's on the screen because I want you to read this. Sex is an expression of intimacy, not the means to intimacy. True intimacy springs from verbal and emotional communion. True intimacy is built on a commitment to honesty, love, and freedom. True intimacy is not primarily a sexual encounter. Intimacy, in fact, has almost nothing to do with our sex organs. A prostitute may expose her body, but her relationships are hardly intimate. Don't answer this publicly, but for those that have given sex away in hope of intimacy, how many have regretted it? You gave a transactional act, but what you wanted was a lifetime of commitment and a lifetime of connection. And so if you're single in here and you're like, yeah, but Pastor B, how do I know if we're going to have chemistry in the bedroom? Listen, if you have chemistry with your clothes on and you leave room for the Holy Spirit, you're going to have good chemistry in bed, all right? And if the first time isn't wildly explosive, it's okay. Make up for lost time. There you go. Go back at it, kid. Go back at it. Try and try again. You got it. You got it. You got, I believe in you. You keep trying. You put in that effort. That's right. You will get the gold medal eventually. Come on. And if you're here and you're married and you are struggling in this area, I'm going to encourage you. Have good, godly conversation with your spouse that's honest. And if you need to meet with a therapist to deal with maybe some past trauma or maybe a sex therapist to meet to deal with some current trauma, I'm a huge fan of work of therapists, and I believe that the power of God's holy word, godly counseling, accountability, and honesty in couples, that good sex can happen because good sex begins in our mind. And if your head tripping about it, it's going to make itself into the bedroom. So for those dealing with sexual shame, I need to wrap this up and say that sex cannot keep you from the love of God. Sex cannot keep you from the love of God. There's no amount of sexual acts or sexual trauma or sexual abuse or sexual partners that can keep you from the love of God. God is in the business of making all things new. You can build sexual boundaries today. Sexual boundaries are not a burden. Sexual boundaries are a benefit. The question I'm asking is, are you willing to change? Are you willing to do something new so that Christ can do something new in you? But this is what I want us to know. You don't have to live in shame. That the shame that you're experiencing doesn't have to break you. Because through the act of Jesus Christ, he said this during the act of communion, this is my body broken for you. Your shame doesn't have to break you. When he was getting beat, when he was getting spat on, when he was getting pummeled, when there was a crown of thorns that was pushed into his head, When his clothes were ripped off of him and he was whipped 39 times, he could have said no. And he could have said stop. But he thought of you. And he thought of me. And today we can surrender our sexual urges, our desires, our hopes, our sin, our iniquity, our loss, our hope. We could surrender our sexuality to the Lord because we are not slaves to our flesh. Today in church, if you are dealing with sexual sin, sexual shame or sexual trauma. I don't want you to feel dragged today. I don't want you to feel accused. I don't want you to have condemnation. If you have conviction, that's something different. But condemnation, that heaviness of I feel like I'm being judged, not in this house. This house will follow the model and the life and the words of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Because in John chapter 8, we are told that there is a woman in Scripture and she's caught in the act of adultery meaning that she's currently engaged in sexual activity. 
as she's dragged through the streets like the shameful person she was. If she's caught in the act, were there sheets wrapped around her ankle? Was she grasping for a blanket as they dragged her out with her bosom bare, trying to cover herself, and she's caught by the religious people of the time, dragged through the city and thrown at the feet of a rabbi named Jesus. And they looked at Jesus and said, this woman was caught in the act of sin. What do you say? Jesus said, ever so kindly, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. One by one, her accusers left. And John 8.10 says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you. Go now and leave your life of sin. Go and sin no more. The words that Jesus said back then are the words that I'm speaking over our house. I want people to live without shame. I want people to live in freedom. And while the world is saying, get yours, God gave his life for you, saying, I have something better. I have freedom for you. You're not a slave to your addictions. You're not a slave to your sin. You're not a slave to your, to your shame. But I want you to go and sin no more. For your family and for your children and for your children's children. Because Deuteronomy, says, Deuteronomy 4 says that there are sins of our father. Meaning many of us are living in the sins that our father and their father and their fathers didn't reconcile with. We, can we be a generation that breaks those strongholds, that breaks the transgressions and say, I am not going to be a slave to my sin. The blood of Jesus Christ has forgiven me and I'm choosing to live a life of purity, married and single. In a moment, we're going to partake in communion. The beautiful thing about having a moment like this in a day where we get to say, not shame on you, but we get to pray and say shame off of you is that we're gonna partake in communion in just a second. In this moment, the scripture says, for us not to partake in communion in an unholy manner. I want us to do some business. If you're here today and you've never said yes to Jesus, this is your moment privately between you and God. I want Jesus to forgive me of my sin and my shame. If you're here today, maybe you're wrestling with an addiction or a stronghold to pornography, expectation, comparison. I want you to lay that down before the Lord before we partake in communion. Maybe you're married in here, very gently without making a scene, maybe grabbing the hand of your spouse and confessing, I've let you down, I've hurt you, I haven't been what I can be. Right now I want us to do some evaluation. Let the worship of God's word bathe over us as we, as individuals come before God and say, cleanse my heart, cleanse my mind. I need you. Before I partake in communion, I want to get right with you. Spirit of the living God, speak to your children in this moment. We love you in Jesus' name.